Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Power to the People, a stack to empower every user to make data-driven decisions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we dive into the content, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. First off, we, would, we will be doing Q&A at the end. With that said, please send in your questions as you have them. You should see a Q&A box on the right-hand side of your console. If you don't see that, there is a menu at the bottom with a button marked Q&A. Hit that, pop it open, and send in your questions through there. Also, we are recording this event, uh, and we will send you the recording and the slides tomorrow. All right, so today I am joined by three fabulous presenters. Uh, first off, we have Dan DeSibble, who is the CTO at Infectious Media. Hello, Dan. Hello, everyone. Looking forward to sharing some of our experiences today. Great. Uh, we are also joined by Carl Usher, the Head of Technology Partnerships for EMEA at Google Cloud. Welcome, Carl. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everybody. And last, we are joined by Zeb Leibowitz, Senior Sales Engineer at Looker. Hi, Zev. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Lena. Okay, so just a quick overview of what we'll be doing today. Um, we'll first have a few introductory slides from both Google and Looker uh, on just kind of what those technologies are, just to kind of, you know, lay the foundation. And then the real bulk of the presentation will be coming from Dan and a, it will be a case study on data-driven decisions at Infectious Media. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Carl to tell us about Google BigQuery. Take it away, Carl. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So as Elena said, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Google BigQuery. But I think the story really starts um, with Google. So hopefully many of you are familiar with Google or use Google on a, a daily basis. Um, but really, 18 years ago, when we set out to build Google, we needed to build it on an infrastructure that would scale. We just saw hundreds of thousands of queries every minute and billions of pages being created throughout the year. So what we needed to do was to build an architecture that would scale. 18 years later, what we've done is we've externalized that architecture. So with Google Cloud Platform, what we're offering is the intelligence, the learning, and the infrastructure that we've used to power some of those Google services you may be familiar with, Gmail, Google, and YouTube, and we're offering that to everybody. So now everybody can take advantage of those learnings and that infrastructure uh, at Google. So that's really Google Cloud Platform. Now within Google Cloud Platform, we have a number of different tools that we offer our customers, one of which is Google BigQuery. And this is a serverless, fully managed enterprise data warehouse. It's got petabyte scale um, and it returns queries in sub-second speeds. It's got the convenience of SQL Server, uh, or SQL rather, so that you can use a standard approach and a standard language in order to ask your queries. So there's not any need to learn a different language or a different vernacular. You can use your standard SQL from whatever SQL database you're using today. And the important thing is we manage this, we look after it, we ensure the lights are on, you just focus on analyzing your data. Now, the story really starts with um, how we've been analyzing data from all the web searches we've been analyzing and all the pages we've been indexing, what we've done is we've started to build intelligence. We've hired some very smart people and they've built um, a number of best practices around how to manage this data at scale. One of the ways to do that was with uh, Google File System, GFS, and then MapReduce. So GFS was about how do we store all this data on off-the-shelf commodity storage and then map reduce being how do we analyze that data how do we move it across different servers as we scale and add additional nodes how do we process that data so we took those uh, learnings and we offered papers in 2002 gfs we released the open source community 2004 we released map reduce to the open source community now the two of those papers you may recognize form the basis for hadoop so hadoop is a very popular technology today at google we have a Hadoop offering, um, but we've kind of developed 
a successor beyond that. One of the successors to that is Google BigQuery. And the benefit of that is the fact that it is uh, fully managed, but also we have solutions like Dataflow. So if I just move through the slide here, you'll see there's a number of papers that started to come out from Google. Now, one in particular in 2008 was Dremel, and that was the paper that forms the basis for BigQuery and our enterprise data warehouse. So I think the key thing to point out here is that it's fully managed. Now, if you think about a typical big data project, there's a number of things you got to think about. You got to think about getting the servers, provisioning them, keeping them alive, keeping them running, performance tuning, monitoring, and these things you typically have to do with Hadoop as well. With Dremel, or Google BigQuery, which is the external name, what we're saying is Google has built an expertise around that. You don't need to worry about it. Let us focus on it, and you just focus on what you do best, understanding your data and making better decisions on that data. And that's really how we provide the best of Looker. Looker is all about you know, democratizing that data and making sure everybody in the organization can access it. And it's important to have an engine that supports that democratization of the data. And we'll touch on that later. So first up, meet Laura. So Laura is an actual employee. She works for Google. Uh, she joined as a business analyst just over a year ago. Now, previously at her former company, they had a data warehouse and that provide information on sales reports and customer data. So she'd be asked by the sales manager, I, I need a report. I'm stressing out here, I need a report. I need it by the end of tomorrow. I've been requested by our CEO. Can you help me out? Now, that was typically a tough job to do because if that data report didn't exist, she'd need to create it. Now, the enterprise data warehouse they used didn't support that uh, ad hoc querying, so the schema would need to be set up to have that data. More often than not, it didn't, which meant she had to go to the IT department and say, hey, this is the challenge I have. IT would say, that's great, but I'm dealing with a lot of things right now. Uh, create a ticket. So she created a ticket. Her manager would be stressing out, his manager would be stressing out, and she'd have to go back and say, listen, IT told me this is gonna take two weeks. So a lot of lost time, a slower time to market, and a lot of stress for everybody working there, which was really frustrating because the data existed, they just couldn't access it in the right way, in a timely manner. So now at Google, uh, she's also a business analyst, and she supports some of our teams, um, some of our sales operations teams, but if she wants to ask a question, she's empowered to ask that question herself. So she no longer needs to go to the IT department. She no longer needs to create a ticket. She simply uses BigQuery, or as we internally call it, Dremel, and she can create those queries herself and get the results back. And if she wants to visualize that data and create charts, which she does, she can use Looker, which is great. So this fundamentally changes how we can leverage data, get access to data in a timely manner and make better decisions on that data. So we have the data in re near real time, um, fresh data that we can make decisions on. And I mentioned earlier Google Cloud Platform. So this is an offering where we've externalized our architecture. And just looking at the data lifecycle, we cover all the different components you may think about for uh, data capture, storage, processing, and analyzing, and then ultimately visualizing that data. So we have you covered across the board. Just kind of bring this home, I want to give you some examples to put this in perspective. Um, so I don't want to go too feature heavy, I just want to talk about how customers are using this. So one of our key customers here in the UK um, is Ocado, a uh, very innovative company, um, one of the first online grocery stores. Um, so they've got lots of data about sales, about customer behavior, about which products are being bought together, which products are fresh, etc. So they need to be able to analyze that in real time. So the conventional wisdom was, hey, let's use, let's use Spark uh, because that will give us great advantages ahead of the competition. They were one of the first to trial our Dataflow product together with Google BigQuery. And this is a quote from um, one of their, their director of technology, in fact. And what he said is, we've been able to take what was a six month project and boil it down to half a day, six hours. So incredible in terms of the the, the reduced cost of operation, the reduced cost of development, and then the quicker time to market. 
Another customer you may be familiar with, um, you may use this on a regular basis, uh, Spotify. So we announced them earlier this year and you know, one of their lead developers said, finally I can tell the world that BigQuery is the best thing to happen to me. Now his wife wasn't too happy with that or his kids, but you know, that suddenly because it changed his life so much in terms of having access to data and not having to worry about managing and keeping uh, servers up and running, that he was happy to tell the world about it. And just, that's just some of the feedback we get from Spotify. They love our data analytics capabilities because it allows them to focus on what matters most to them, which is the user, and getting them the right recommendations and understanding what, what's important to them, not keeping the servers running. And then finally, we have, you know, this industry banking is typically seen as not the fastest of followers, but we've been working with Lloyd's Banking Group and they actually see it as a partnership. Um, We've been taking some of their customer uh, web public data and we've been helping them to analyze that data using BigQuery. And they say that that has reduced the amount of time to insight so that they can make decisions from 96 hours to being able to do that in 30 minutes. So it's really changing how they can react to trends and best support their customers because they don't need to worry about managing the data and keeping the servers running. They just worry on how do we extract the data and how do we empower everyone in the business to make better decisions on the data using Google, BigQuery, and Looker? And that's all for me. Thanks. So, I'll, you know, I'll really pick it up uh, here. Um, you know, leaving off with that story about Laura, right, about the analyst who wants to get access from data, this is really where kind of Looker comes in. Um, here at Looker, we built our tool um, really at, at, with the goal of making it easy for everybody at an organization to find, explore, and understand the data drives your, drives your business. And when I say that, you know, we found that there are lots of other tools out there that, that have that same mission. Um, and we really found that, that companies that are using other tools often today fall into one of two buckets. That first, first bucket is the data bottleneck, right? That's the environment um, that was mentioned earlier, you know, pre-BigQuery pre even in some cases, where there are a small number of people who have access to the data. Maybe those people are writing manual SQL queries against a data set like, like BigQuery. Right? Even if we have that, all of our data centralized in that one store, there are a small number of people who can write those queries and get that data out. It might also mean that you're using a legacy tool that takes really specialized knowledge long development life cycles to build a new report or build a new data mart to get data out. And in the data bottleneck environment, right, people, business decision makers can't get the data they need to actually make decisions in the, in the time that they need to get that data. So, you know, business, the data can't move as fast right, as, as business needs to move. There are other businesses out there, right, or other organizations out there um, that, that have the opposite problem. They use tools where you know, any business analyst can extract the data set, pull it into their local environment, play with it, do some analysis, get really quick and agile answers. Right? And that's really great because business analysts can interact with data independently. They can, and they can make decisions, you know, at, again, at that speed of business with data. The issue here then becomes you've lost any sense of governance, right? There are a lot of legacy, you know, there are legacy tools out there previously, you know, that had established, you know, established governance, ensured that everybody in the organization has that same sense of truth. And that's what, you know, generated that data, data bottleneck. In the data chaos environment, we now lo no longer have any consistency across an organization. We end up in a situation, which I know many of us have been in, where we sit down in a meeting where instead of fighting about are making, you know, arguing about the decisions that we're making, we're arguing about who num whose numbers are correct. So at Looker, we aim to solve, you know, solve both of those problems, right? Make the, make the best of both worlds and find a balance between the standards, the scalability, the governance of some of the legacy IT-driven BI tools alongside the self-service, the agility, the flexibility, those, that ability to make decisions, right? Really make data decisions data-driven decisions at the time that, the time and place that, that business decisions are being made. And we try to find a balance between those two, what have previously been conflicting sets of needs. The way we've been able to do that here at Looker 
and the core of what our tool supports is enabled by three major technical pillars. The first is that as an application, Looker is 100% in database. We leverage all of the horsepower of our customers' underlying analytical data warehouses, things like BigQuery. Once the customers brought all of their data into that fast, fast underlying database, we can transform it in place. We're not aggregating, we're not extracting, we're not cubing data, and we're taking advantage of all of that horsepower and all, all of that analytical, all that analytical power, right, and that our customers have invested in within tools like BigQuery. The second thing we're doing within Looker is we're providing what we call a data modeling layer. LookML is a language that we've developed here at Looker, and it allows data experts, the people who today might be writing SQL queries, who understand the schema of the database, to describe and define that data to create reusable and shareable pieces of business logic that then can be used consistently throughout the entire organization so that everybody's accessing a single source of truth of your metrics, whether those metrics come from your sales and transactional data, from customer and CRM data sets, even from web, track, web tracking or Internet of, Thing data, Internet of Things data, Internet of Things data sets, excuse me. All those data sets live within the data warehouse and they're modeled and defined within LookML. And then for the users interacting with that data, the folks who actually you know, want to slice and dice and aggregate data to explore, Looker provides a, an entirely web-based tool to self-service against that full breadth of data that's made available you know, via Looker in your data warehouse. Looker is a, a true born-in-the-web application. That means users can access and interact that, with that data from any browser-based environment that they're working with, whether it be on a desktop or a, a mobile device or a tablet. Using native web tools, they can share and collaborate and save the content that they're building. And with Looker's web architecture, those data sets, those reports, those analyses can actually be extended into other applications, into third-party tools, or even embedded within products that our customers are servicing out to their end clients. Architecturally, because Looker doesn't extract any data, and right, because we are this lightweight layer that where we've modeled data, we also scale horizontally just like any other web app. So for cases where our customers have thousands or tens of thousands of internal or external users of analytics within their own application, Looker is going to scale right alongside your own, your own infrastructure that you're servicing out applications with. So those three pillars put together really make what we like, really make Looker what we like to call a data platform. And what I mean by a data platform is an environment where anybody can ask the questions that they have of the data, whether that be an analyst using a drag and drop interface to query data on the fly, whether that be a data scientist or a developer extracting data programmatically from our APIs to really build a true consistent data-driven culture around the entire organization where everything, all data emanates from that underlying powerful data lake or data warehouse. Our single source of definitions as an organization, our standards that we've created are managed by a team of data experts. And then individual stakeholders from across the organization right, can get the data in a consistent format or consistent set of against a consistent set of definitions that they need to get their job done. And because Looker is connected to the underlying databases, every individual user has access to whatever level of granularity or aggregation of data they might need. So if we're looking at a petabyte scale, Google BigQuery data warehouse, a user can look at high level summaries, aggregations of that data, as well as drill into row level details to look at particular trends for individual customers individual products, individual sites, whatever they might be tracking. The last thing I just want to cover here briefly, you know, before I, before I hand things over next, is our particular partnership with, with Google BigQuery. So as I mentioned earlier, Looker's in-database architecture, you know, leverages that horsepower of BigQuery, lets you take advantage of that investment that you've made because all the transformation is done natively in the database. For those of you who might be familiar with Looker already, 
We have a really tight coupling within LookML and within the application directly with the BigQuery dialect. So all of the highest level features and analytical tools available in Looker, things like symmetric aggregates, persistent drive tables, they're all available when you're connecting Looker to BigQuery. And finally, because all of the processing that Looker does is done directly within the underlying database that we're connecting to, all of the unique features that are available natively within BigQuery are available for in the, pro in the application within Looker and within the modeling layer within Looker to take advantage of. So things like custom, func custom functions, using both, being able to connect to legacy and standard SQL, and handling Google Query, a uh, BigQuery specific features like nested fields and partition tables are all exposed directly within the modeling layer within Looker. So now that you all have had a, an, introduction, an introduction both to BigQuery and to Looker, I'm going to hand it off to Dan and Infectious Media to talk to you about what you've really come to hear, um, what you've really come to hear, um, which is his story about you know what he's done at Infectious Media there. Cool, thanks, Ev. So um, I think, I mean, really what I want to do is take you guys through the journey that Infectious Media had in uh, processing all their data, sticking it somewhere that was, that was useful, that could be queried, and then actually putting something on top of it that we could actually use to query that data. Um, but first, I want, to, I want to kick off and uh, talk about us a little bit. Um, we're obviously probably not quite as famous as Google and uh, certainly not quite, as, uh, not quite as famous as Looker, I think, um, saying not within these spaces. But, but what do we do? So we are... We are uh, a programmatic specialist media buying agency, um, which basically means that we, we buy web space, um, but rather than buying in bulk, we buy it in real time, um, and we only buy uh, programmatically enabled uh, inventory sources. Um, we are a global company, um, so we're actually live in, in probably more, more like 40 plus markets now, um, and we have a transparent model, but perhaps the, the major difference between us and your standard run-of-the-mill media buying agency is that we have built our own technology platform. Um, Impression Desk is, is our platform that um, essentially pulls together all of the highly granular log file data uh, and aggregated data from all the different media buying platforms that we use. Um, and it um, <clears throat> merges it together with a lot of the Data plat the third-party data platforms and DMPs that we that we use, uh, and sticks it all together in in one place so that we can do smart uh, analysis uh, and insight um, across many many different different platforms. So um, we will use buying platforms such as AppNexus. We we'll use buying platforms such as Google's own DBM, uh, Amazon, Facebook, um, and but you know we've also built. Uh, our own bidder, our own DSP for 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 getting very like highly transparent uh, access to a lot of the inventory they wanted to use, um, and this creates a, a, an interesting problem, um, which I think is, is, is covered really by this slide. So, real time bidding generates an awful lot of data. Um, so the, the kind of examples I put on the data processing side, so if we're looking at probably impression, just, just pure impressions, so when, when we show an advert, um, we are probably in excess of, of, of 4,000 requests a second. Um, each of these requests isn't very large, um, but it still generates, you know, when you're talking about these kind of volumes, you are looking at, you know, typically half a terabyte a day. Um, when you move up to the kind of bid request or auction level data that our DSP has access to, you, you end up processing more like half a million requests a day. And again, they are quite small, but it ends up being an order of magnitude much, much larger than that. Um, you know, recording all that data, um, collating it into log files, shoving it somewhere like um, Amazon S3 or, or, or um, uh, Google Cloud Storage, it's, it's, it's relatively easy for us, but then actually doing something with that afterwards um, tends to be the problem. And, and this is the same, like, um, whether you're dealing with log files from AppNexus or DBM or everyone else. You, you, know, you, can get it into, you can get a log file somewhere 
uh, more local to you or closer to you, but then actually putting it into a database, putting it in something that you can process or, or, or use to analyze data tends to be difficult. Um, and, and even once you've done that, Having, having some way of people accessing that data, uh, having something that's intuitive, that's easy, that allows them to really sort of mine the gold that exists in that data is, is tends to be a, a different challenge in itself. Um, I think many businesses will have, will have experienced this, but as, as soon as you uh, hit the it doesn't fit in Excel problem, um, you, you kind of realize that you have to move to bigger and better things. Um, and much much as I hate uh, Excel, it does feel like that's what the uh, the whole world still runs off in terms of analytics these days. So, where do we start? So, we started back in 2010, um, building, our own, building our own technology, and uh, we started with something called Infobyte Community Edition. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, but back then it was a fantastic open source columnar database. Um, the reason we went open source is because we were a relatively small company with uh, not much money, and um, whilst we were being courted very he heavily by people like IBM the teaser and, uh, and, and, and HP's Vertica and all that kind of stuff, we didn't have a spare million dollars to uh, invest in the database. Um, but, the, but the nice thing about it as well, it was, it was simple open source software. We could easily install it in, in AWS, which we were using extensively back then. Um, and a you know, key for us is that it used standard SQL for queries. So um, a lot of the analysts that were hiring at the time, they were SQL um, savvy, they knew, they knew their staff, and they didn't have to learn something brand new to move on. Now, the problems with uh, the open source version of, of Infobrite was essentially that they had limited it to make you go for the paid for version. So they had made it single threaded, um, they had um, limited the amount of data it could process, uh, and actually loading in data could be slow. So you know, loading a day's worth of data, we could probably do in, you know, an hour or two. But as we started to grow, as data started to, to increase in size, we saw that creeping up probably faster than linearly. And it was one of those kind of situations like, hmm, we're going to hit a scaling point soon where we can't, um, where we can't use this anymore. So <clears throat> we did what all two companies do when they get a bit bigger and they have a bit of money. We decided to pay for it. <laughs> we moved to um, to the Infobite Ent Enterprise Edition, and and partly again this was because there was a simple upgrade path to it. Um, pretty much, you install the license key and it unlocks all the all, all the hidden features. Um, it allowed us to be multi-threaded. It allowed us to do parallel data loads, and I think you know it really took us to the next level where we could be you know um, happy for the next. I don't know, a year, I suppose, um, processing data, looking after it, and working. I think it still had similar problems, uh, or some some problems to the to the um, open source version. So concurrency wasn't great as, as we started to grow, as we started to add more analysts to the team. Um, we started noticing it slowing down more and more. Um, one of the other issues for us was that it wasn't really cloud native. So whilst you could um, stick it on a bigger box. You know, the limitations of AWS back then where there's only a certain size of box available to it and it started becoming very expensive very quickly. Um, but I think the, the, the bigger problem that we had um, with moving to more enterprise um, software licensing models is that they priced um, on an amount of data stored um, uh, metric and, and essentially the amount you paid would grow linearly with the amount of data that you were storing. And we we saw back then very quickly that the amount of data that we were processing, the amount of data that we were storing was growing exponentially. And we realized very, very quickly that, that okay, this isn't sustainable. We are going to hit a point where the costs of what well, the license costs uh, of the data is going to far outweigh any benefit that we get from it. Um, so we knew we had to look for something different. Um, and, you know, we did what many other companies do. And Carl kind of alluded to this, we jumped on the Hadoop bandwagon. Um, and I see many companies still doing this today. Uh, and Hadoop is a very, very good system. Um, uh, we jumped on it because everyone else was doing it. Um, again, open source, no licensing costs. Um, and it, you know, in a lot of respects, it almost seems perfect for cloud deployment. You know, you can you can expand it horizontally. You can you can uh, make use of things in that, like Amazon Spot instances to reduce your costs. Um, there's a whole variety of different things that you can do with it that, that make it really ideal, or ideal so we thought um, um, for, for for handling all of our data needs. 
the reality was a bit different. I think um, we we struggled an enormous amount. So over over the course of the next few months, we we basically realised that you couldn't really use standard SQL. I mean, yes, you can layer on <coughs> Hive, you can layer on, oh, sorry, HBase and Hive, you can layer on Impala and lots of things to get SQL access, but it's not quite the same. And you still have to spend a lot of time loading your data in, in a particular way to make that work. Um, concurrency was basically non-existent as soon as we had like, you know, three or four people using it all at the same time. Unless we'd swelled the cluster to an enormous size, it, it quickly became a huge bottleneck, which was not really something that we were particularly happy with. Um, and, and, and because of that, because, because we didn't really know what we were doing, our server costs quickly you know, became difficult to control. It's like if we hit a concurrency problem, what do we do to expand the cluster, rebuild it, and redo all the processing of data? Um, would, we, you know, would we try and stick it on bigger boxes rather than adding more boxes? There was, there was a huge amount of stuff that was just very difficult and very expensive to research. Um, but perhaps the biggest cost really to us was the fact that it really took an army of infrastructure engineers to, to maintain it. So back then, we, we only had um, one or two um, uh, engineers looking at it. And very quickly, we realized that we are, we are never going to succeed um, with this few people looking at it. With the data loads, that, with all the data sizes that we had, um, and our relative lack of experience with Hadoop, it's like we need to go off to, you know, do a bunch of training courses, do Hadoop University, whatever it is, you know, before we can get any use out of this. And, and similarly, our analysts then have to go and learn uh, Pig, or they have to go and basically learn how to structure their, their queries in a, in a particular way to fit in with what Hadoop does. Um, I think it's it's really interesting because it, 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 we, we kind of understood after a while that Hadoop itself isn't that great for exploratory analytics. It's, it's kind of good if you know the question that you want the answer to, but if you are trying to find and understand, uh, you're trying to explore some data, ask some initial questions, and then delve deeper into that, it's not something that, that it's particularly suited for. So... Thankfully, around this time, um, one of my infrastructure engineers was being courted by, by Google. And um, this was, I think, this was, yeah, this was about three years ago when, when, when BigQuery had just, um, just entered, entered beta, um, I think. And it was pretty much sold into us as like, hey, we're Google, we process the most data in the world probably. Um, it's completely no ops. You don't need any infrastructure engineers on this. It is cloud native. Um, oh, and it's particularly inexpensive. Um, and we did, we did some analysis. We looked at it and went, hmm, this, 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 feels, this feels a little bit too good to be true. This feels like, you know, we put our data in there. It's very easy. And we don't have to worry about it. Um, Anything that goes on the back end, we just stick our analysts on it and run, and run it, and things things work. Um, so we implemented it, and amazingly, we found out that it wasn't too good to be true. It just was that good. Um, I know, I know, uh, uh, Carl's made made some made some statistics or shown you some stats from from before. Ours were a little bit different. Um, again, it depends on the, on the kind of data you have and uh, and how it works. But we saw. Well, just literally in pure um, pure query times, we saw a 10x improvement. Um, but this was before you even looked at the fact that we were now looking at way more data um, than we were looking at before. Because at the same time that we were running our InfraBright um, stuff um, previously, you know, our data had grown exponentially again as we as we moved into new markets and uh, and uh, new areas. Um, you know, previously we were limited by these licensing costs uh, that I mentioned before. So we, we stored less than five terabytes of that data. BigQuery easily is 50 terabytes, um, if not more. And again, because of the charging model, it just it just it, it doesn't it doesn't matter too much. I mean, it does matter, but the, the you know the, the charging mechanism is not tied to um, how much data you store. Um, and and really, like you know. Even when we were running InfoBright, we um, we still needed an infrastructure engineer to manage the server, to optimize it, uh, all the stuff that, that that Carol mentioned before, and and 
with BigQuery. There was just no need for that at all. It's literally, it's almost like a, a fire and forget solution. You load your data in and you set your analysts on it and it's it's there, it's done. It's, it's, it ends up being a little bit like data nirvana in a way um, to try and um, communicate how excited we were when it ended up being quite as good uh, or, or as good as, as, as we hoped it would be was is, is very difficult to do. Um, Similarly, going on with staffing, so we, need, we needed a couple, of, a couple of data engineers to manage the data loads before because, again, you had to spend some time not just loading the data but then optimizing it, um, you know, having a look at the table structures and, and, and changing them as necessary. Now we just need one guy, really. Um, he sits there twiddling his thumbs most of the time. Um, but, but actually, he, you know, he spends a lot of his time pulling in new data sources, uh, which is good. Um, and then, really, I mean, I think one of the – one of the great benefits was this was that we could reassign a bunch of people to be analysts. So rather than having many more engineers who are good for keeping your data, you know, kind of um, clean and, 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 and well-formed, et cetera, because we didn't need so many of them, we could actually then either re, you know, reassign them to analytics duties or, or move them to, to other stuff that are related to our bidder. So previously we only had three analysts because that's how much the, the budgets would allow. Now we've been able to update it to six analysts um, who just sit there and, and, and can sit there answering, answering questions really. And, and the key point about looking at these two different things is that looking at, looking at how much we're paying for infrastructure costs, how much we're paying for data storage and how much we're paying for people, really with people, these two scenarios, they cost the same. Um, with, you know, they cost the same, but with the added benefit, you have to store and analyze way more data much, much more quickly. Um, so it was, it was pretty exciting for us, and it was, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing sea change for us. So <clears throat> I think, you know, we as techies were pretty happy um, with managed to flatten our, uh, our data, data processing costs or costs associated with, with, with data and analytics. And uh, we thought, oh, great, now we can all go home. Not, not, quite, uh, not quite as good, <laughs> or, not, or, not, or, not, or we weren't quite there yet. So it turned out we, ha we have a team of, uh, of optimization managers who essentially optimize our campaigns, make them all work uh, uh, much better, um, uh, and they spend a, lot, spend a lot of time analyzing the performance of these, uh, of these campaigns. They were still stuck using and analyzing data on our aggregate database, which is a simple MySQL uh, database that pulls you know, aggregated data for performance and stuff. And they'd kind of heard of this new BigQuery thing, and, they, and they'd heard that it was quite exciting. And they heard it could uh, answer a lot of their, their prayers and their, and, and, and their questions. Um, because previously, every time they wanted to understand where a campaign was working, like what's, what's going right down to some granular, which sites were working, how they would... Um, how they might improve things by changing the targeting of a campaign, they'd have to ask the analytics team. And the analytics team would then go into BigQuery, write some SQL, pull out the answers, and then, and, then, and then send them back. And whilst this wasn't a slow process, it's still, you know, with the, with the backwards and forwards of emails and clarifications, um, it, would take, uh, it would take maybe a few hours or a few days. Um, and you'd also often get the, the, the situation where, where an optimizer would ask a question, they'll get the answer back, and then realize that that, that question wasn't the right one to ask. Um, not having that kind of free and open access to the data directly basically led to lots of impatience and frustration. They knew the data was there, but, you know, they just couldn't get access to it, and it's like, you know, stamping their feet like small children. <laughs> um, and... Um, this is kind of where Looker came in. So we'd already deployed Looker for, for our, like, our aggregated MySQL database, and everybody loved it. This, this was something that um, our entire company was using right from sea level all the way down to, 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 to the most junior analysts. Um, you know, we, we've been working with Looker for about three years now, um, very, from very early on, and... and um, I, I personally love the elegant abstraction of, of, of our underlying data, data warehouses with LookML. I mean, LookML is great. Um, and 
one of the best bits of it was this this kind of this ability to really explore explore the data you have be able to fiddle with it you know um, drill into it uh, and really trying to get a feel for it um, but in a very safe environment SQL is one of those things that um, it's great if you understand it um, but you can get yourself into horrible messes very, very quickly. Um, and when we previously tried to release our SQL to, to a bunch of our team that weren't technical in nature, the, the number of messes they managed to get themselves into was quite frightening. Um, so, so definitely having that safe kind of safe space for uh, for data explanation was was was, was fantastic. Um, being able to automate queries um, to, to, to email out to uh, either themselves or, or to our clients. Um, uh, as well as import data into the uh, infamous Excel um, was, was, was great. Um, and, you know, allowing us to evolve the underlying, basically allowing us to evolve the database whilst um, evolving the QML uh, allowed us, you know, gave us a lot of freedom to, to grow and uh, develop our database as, as, as we got bigger. Um, and other, other, other huge benefit of Looker really is, is or are they user defined dashboards, which which are great again. So what are some of the things that, that um we've managed to do by effectively layering on Looker on top of BigQuery? Um so so by giving optimizers this kind of very granular access to very low level, you know, very kind of impression level data, um, they can do things like this. So it's a particular example where um, we had a travel uh, a travel client. Uh, we were running campaigns um, that were that were targeting London or people wanted to travel to London rather, and they wanted to extend the campaign by having a look at um, uh, you know, trying to target people that wanted to travel to Paris. Um, and very quickly, using a look at dashboard on top of BigQuery, we could generate what you can what you can kind of see on your screen, which is um, the difference in the some of the characteristics of the people that uh, that, that that are searching for Paris versus searching for London. So you know we could see the kind of sites that they were looking at, um, all sites they were visiting. Um, um, we could see. Uh, the kind of uh, towns they were they were based in or cities and 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 other stuff there was which was just like a, a you know a huge boon to the optimizers because they could very very quickly go ah oh, right okay here's my existing uh, campaign that's targeting london here are the tweaks that i need to do to to change that so i can target people that look for that that, that tend to um want to travel to Paris and I can get them before, perhaps before they even know that they want to travel to Paris. And I can start sending them some of those key interesting adverts that might push them into, into booking a trip. Um, the great out output from this was really like um, before setting up campaigns was very much a, a, you know, a, trial, um, a trial and error process. Whereas pretty much being able to have access to the data meant that they could set something up straight away, uh, which would then perform before having to wait, rather than having to wait a week for seeing the results of that campaign to check whether it was going to perform or not. So again, massively beneficial. Um, the second example that I wanted to share um, was around something that plagues our industry, which is really fraud and brand safety. Um, so when you are working in real-time spaces, there is quite a lot of opportunity for um, people to defraud uh, like like advertising basically pretend they you're showing advertising on a website that that is not real or is sounds like a very good website um, like the Guardian uh, when it isn't um, as well as your potential to serve on content that might not necessarily be what the advertiser deems as as as, as brand safe so you know whether that is very, very, very political content, or perhaps even illegal content. Those are things that you want to avoid. Um, so again, using this very kind of granular uh, impression level data, we we basically pull this data into BigQuery um, straight from from our DSP. We then join it with um, our fraud and brand safety partner, who again provides us data at this very granular impression level, and that allows us to create dashboards like this 
which can show us like, okay, we can see how many fake domains that we've ended up serving on. We can see the kind of characteristics of those things. And more importantly, we can then use all this data to identify you know, particularly bad exchanges or particularly bad sites that we can just simply block. Um, and just, you know, before we even bid on them, we can stop showing them. And and the real benefit of that is that, yeah, we can update our whitelists, our blacklists, um, and massively, massively reduce wasted spend. So there is ongoing work with this. Um, we we found that um, so BigQuery, BigQuery charges by, um, it charges a little bit for storing the data, uh, not that much, but it charges you actually on a per query basis and, and, and really on how that query, um, how much data that query analyzes. Um, and when we were initially told of this, it's like, ooh, that, that those costs could grow very, very quickly. Um, thankfully, they didn't for the first first two or three years. Um, but when we laid Looker on top of it, um, because we gave so much more access to the data to so many more people, um, it literally went up from the six analysts to about 30 people uh, across the business now who, who have access to this data. We did find costs kind of ballooned as a result. Um, now, in true, in true Google style, Google provide a way of pulling all the costs of each query from BigQuery back into BigQuery. And uh, so we've, uh, we've spent a bit of time building a cost monitoring dashboard in Looker to help us sort of uh, manage and, and maintain those costs. And also, we are, we are very aware that there is a, there's a flat rate pricing model for, for BigQuery, which when you hit a certain limit, which we, which we may be in the next few months or so, may be worth, uh, may be worth switching to. Um, the, the other benefits, or the other, the, other, the other work that we're looking at doing, so BigQuery used to have its own version of SQL, it still does, um, legacy SQL, and um, they made a move to, to switching to standard, to standard SQL, which is, which is fantastic in terms of like, you know, knowledge and learning on how, on how, to, on how to query, etc. Um, but it's actually had another benefit as well, it's, it's actually made the queries even faster um, and the, the really nice thing is that, that Looker have mirrored this um, with their development and with their integration uh, with BigQuery, which means that we can change to this. It does require a migration, so we haven't done it yet. Um, but given the, the speed increases on the, on the queries, it's, it's definitely something that we're looking at with, uh, with high priority. Um, and the last piece is uh, the release of BigQuery regions, which actually happened at the beginning of this year. Um, so. Again, working with the amount of data, the amount of granular data that we that we do, we we have to be very careful of our data governance. Um, so um, as soon as the regions were released, we um, um, we moved each region's uh, data to be in a in a region that was local to it. So European data stays in Europe, US data stays in US, and APAC data stays in, in APAC. And this is great for, gov for governance reasons. It means that we're not moving data across different borders that we may or may not be allowed to um, for the various data laws that exist. Um, but it also means that we can be comfortable in telling our clients, hey, look, your data isn't going to leave this particular region, which, which is great. Um, however, it does create problems for us if we are trying to do some kind of trend analysis or understanding how different regions operate across those different regions. So that is, that is something that we're working, working on right now um, uh, to, to, to understand how we, can, how we can make that happen. So to finish off my little bit, uh, I think, you know, I see, I see all businesses going through this kind of uh, this journey. Um, and the, 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 certainly with us, I feel that journey has been accelerated simply because of the scale um, that we've been dealing with, the scale of the data, and how quickly it um, and how quickly it grows. You know, the exponential growth of that um, scale really makes those simple questions require some really smart solutions. Like one of the hardest things that we had to deal with was just trying to understand our reach across different regions and doing simple things like count distinct. Uh, count distinct on users or, or, or user IDs uh, in these individual regions. As our data exploded, it became one of the biggest things that, that caused problems. Um, thankfully, again, BigQuery solves that, which is really, really helpful for us. Um, and I think one of the key things that I wanted to get across was this, is that BigQuery really handles the scale that many companies use Hadoop for. And you could actually save an awful lot of money, but, but more importantly, time and complexity by moving some, a lot of Hadoop-based architectures into BigQuery. I mean, it won't, it won't do everything that Hadoop does, um, and it certainly isn't designed to do everything that, that, that Hadoop does, but 
certainly for that kind of exploratory analytics and that kind of processing that many, many companies really want to do, BigQuery is way, way better suited. And I think lastly, you know, <clears throat> a lot of the time we spend 90% of the time trying to get data into the right format, into the right places, into the, into the right platforms so that you can, you can spend your remaining 10% of the time answering questions. But once you layer on Looker onto BigQuery, it really allows you to, your team to spend that 90% actually getting their, those answers and really being kind of shielded from some of those problems of, of, of scale. Um, and really, I think that combination of, of the two technologies for us has really, really revolutionized our business uh, and allowed us to really have a solution that we feel is going to continue to grow as fast as we do. And that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. That was fantastic. And I feel like our attendees probably learned quite a bit about both Looker and inquiry. Um, so we have had a few questions come in. Um, Zev, I'm going to start it off with you. Um, how does data access control uh, basically to ensure that users only see the data that they are supposed to see? Yeah, great. Thanks for that question, Elena. That's a really good one. Um, so permissioning in Looker is all uh, controlled within that modeling layer because we're describing the data that's in the database. You can then associate uh, different data elements, whether that be tables, columns, or even row level access to data uh, to individual users who log into Looker. Um, so you can maintain for each individual user um, true self-service and the ability to explore data while also uh, maintaining the particular uh, appropriate, the particular permissions, right, and, and data, uh, data access for each of those users. Great. Um, Alrighty, so I'm going to send this next one to Dan. Uh, do you have any processes or tools that uh, allow for the centralization of disparate data? Basically, how are you taking other types of data and putting that all into BigQuery? All right, fun with mute. <clears throat> uh -huh. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I think so we, we, we do have, um, I, mean, I talked about, I haven't mentioned this, but, but perhaps I should have. We do have our own separate ETL system. So we, rather than uh, taking off the shelf ETL system, we, we've built our own, uh, a Python-based thing, which essentially pulls in data um, in a variety of different sources. So it can pull using APIs via XML or, or JSON or various other things, um, or indeed query databases directly, um, or it would ingest log files. Um, it is a key part to our data pipeline. Um, and the reason that we chose to build our own rather than uh, using an off-the-shelf one, because much like many of the things that we do, there's always things that off-the-shelf platforms don't quite do, um, and it kind of frustrates us. We are a company of engineers, and, and we like building solutions. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, we look at and BigQuery aren't the only solutions, um, or aren't the only part of our of our, of our data data pipeline uh, or, or data uh, platform. But um, but yeah, we, we do have a separate ETL. Fantastic. All right, uh, Dan, this one is also for you. Um, so how knowledgeable were your staff on BigQuery prior to your investment? Did you need to invest a lot in training? Um, so our staff knew nothing about BigQuery prior to the investment. Um, we actually had um, uh, a slightly maverick infrastructure engineer that was sold into Google, and he literally just took one of our log files, loaded it straight into BigQuery, and then handed it over to the analytics team. Um, and the analytics team essentially ran some similar queries to, to what they were running on our, on our, on our previous systems on InfoBright, and uh, went, it's faster, let's get it. <laughs> and uh, pretty much after we um, had a quick check of the costs uh, that came through, it was like, yeah, let's switch to this wholeheartedly. So there was definitely no training needed, initial training. Um, it, it's, it's intuitive enough that you can, you can learn most of the stuff that you need to do from, from references online, um, as long as you have a good knowledge of SQL and, and a good knowledge of how, of how databases work. Got it. Um... All righty. So, Dan, uh, you said that uh, the cost before 
uh, before BigQuery and after BigQuery ended up being the same. Uh, this person wants to know how that takes into account uh, headcount and salary uh, and infrastructure engineers, um, and just, I guess, how that comparison is done. So, um, if, we, if you take out headcount um, completely um, from the equation, then BigQuery was cheaper for the same amount of data. Um, as the data increased, I think it became considerably more cheaper because, like I said before, so this is just, just, just to clarify, um, we were comparing it with the Infra, uh, sorry, yeah, Infobrite Enterprise Edition. Because the costs scaled linearly with the amount of data that you were storing, and BigQuery costs tend not to, um, as long as you're managing your queries correctly, um, it's very much something that uh, it, it becomes almost cheaper, if you like, the, the, more, the more data you put into it. Um, uh, comparatively, when I put in the staffing uh, or the headcount numbers as well, it became almost a no-brainer. Um, it's, as I said, the, the, the amount of staff that you do need to support a Hadoop-based infrastructure just before you even can query the data um, is fairly substantial. You know, even if it's two people, it's, it's, it's quite a large cost to, to some of the smaller companies out there using Hadoop. Um, and it's something that, again, you just don't have that cost of big query, and you can take those people, and you can either save that cost, or you can you can reassign them to do things like analytics, or to do some other other, other engineering work. Perfect. Uh, so we have another question about a little bit about uh, where your data is coming from. Uh, I think people just kind of want to know what type of data you're analyzing, uh, and then also if you're exporting data out of big query at all. Cool. Um, so all of our data comes from uh, the demand side platforms, the DSPs I was talking about. It's all log file data. Uh, well, sorry, the majority of the very, very highly granular data comes from there. We also do pull um, things like data segments uh, or lists of, 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 of users via APIs. Um, um, but but the majority of it is flat file transfer. So people will drop flat files into a GCS bucket for us, a Google Cloud Storage bucket, or an S3 bucket, um, or an FTP server somewhere. We'll pull that in. Um, <clears throat> or we've also started to make use of, of the new BigQuery connector feature, so we can pull log file, Google log file data, like DCM log files or DBM log files, directly into BigQuery. Um, we so that. That all works out pretty well for us. Um, for, for, we do do uh, extraction and exports uh, as well. Uh, again, we, we pull it out. You, you just use um, use the Google Cloud, uh, sorry, the Google BigQuery API to export a data file as a CSV, a JSON, or whatever you like, and then again copy it to a GCS bucket or copy it to an S3 bucket or copy it elsewhere. So it's not something that we we find particularly difficult, um, but again, this is also where our kind of own proprietary ETL system comes in, which accesses the various APIs available to us and uses them to push data around. Great. Uh, okay, uh, so I am going to send this last question that we have time for to Zev. Uh, maybe just like a quick answer on this. Uh, where can we learn more about how Looker controls data government, particular, governance, sorry, particularly how it relates to competitors like Tableau? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got lots of great material on our website, uh, looker.com. We've got case studies about those exact topics. Um, and I'm sure Elena and I could also, uh, whoever asked the question, uh, reach out to you directly um, to answer any specific questions that you have. Perfect. All right, so that is it for today. Um, first off, thank you to all of our presenters. You are all fantastic, and uh, I hope everybody learned something today. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we did record this, and we will send you the slides and the recording tomorrow. Uh, if you want to learn more about Google BigQuery or Looker, um, there are some links on your screen right now that should be live and send you two options to get free trials of either of the technologies. Uh, and then the last thing is that we have another webinar coming up this week on Thursday with a partner of ours, Parsley, uh, and it's titled Beyond the Data, sorry, Beyond the Dashboard, uh, What You Can Learn from Raw Audience Data. Uh, so if you just can't get enough webinars, uh, that's simply a great option for you. All right, thank you again for attending, and thank you again to our presenters, and I hope you have a wonderful day.